the state of economics is is essentially one in which uh, uh, you know there is a certain ideology you can call it neoliberal that continues to be dominant and and that's essentially the purpose of economics to to use you know this neoliberal discourse to push certain policies around the globe so my name is Matias Renengo. I'm currently professor at Bucknell University. I was previously at uh, the University of Utah for 10 years. And uh, I worked for the Central Bank of Argentina for two years as a senior research manager. Any crisis opens up the space for, so if you look at my sort of longish reply to the, you know, the question of why uh, what's the state of economics? Uh, 1870s, you know, the 1870, 1873 to 1893 is a big crisis. It was called the Great Depression before the Great Depression. It's also, you know, uh, the 30s, you know, the Great Depression is the other sort of, you know, and the 1960s itself, you know, 60s, 70s, it's, it's a period of crisis that eventually leads to the, you know, inflation in the 70s and whatnot, but it's a crisis of the international system that, you know, sort of held during the golden age of capitalism. So periods of crisis are good because they sometimes lead to, uh, you know, the opening up of possibilities for alternative discourses. Uh, yet one important thing that happened in, you know, in the 30s, uh, in the period that goes from the 30s to the 60s, was that we had, uh, for good or for bad, whatever you think about, uh, you know, the Soviet system, you had an alternative. And you had that capitalist, capitalist societies were concerned with the fact that, oh, maybe these guys are going to go communist and that's a danger, so sure, uh, we're going to you know, acquiesce to some of the demands of uh, labor. That didn't happen in 2008. If you go to my blog, you know, uh, Naked Keynesianism, there is a post, uh, you know, which was, the blog started after the crisis, considerably after, I think it's 2011. But there is a post somewhere there that I discuss. There were all of these hopes that we, you know, in a sense, INET is about this hope that we are going to have new economic thinking. And, and I'm all for that. And create, you know, INET is a, an institution that is trying to create space for different kinds of alternative views on how to look at the economy. And the, what I suggested in you know, that post uh, exactly was exactly that there is a limit to how much we're going to actually get out of this. Because uh, at the end of the day, you know, there is a sociology of the profession. So how, how the Keynesian revolution, to some extent, won space. Because they won Harvard, they won uh, Cambridge, which was central at that point. But they, you know, essentially they had to win in the US because the, you know, dynamic center of the economy was switching to the US. So they won Harvard, they won uh, Berkeley. They didn't win in the middle in the uh, in Chicago, but they win key places, uh, MIT, which became central with Samuelson. Uh, and they eventually also entered institutions like, they, they were already there in, in some way even better with the institution, and he said, but the, the Council of Economic Advisors. So, so a key moment is when Kennedy comes out and says, basically, you know, the simple multiplier story works, and, you know, he has people like Solo and Tobin and Okun and whatnot working for him and says, oh, we're going to do a tax cut to increase the level of activity and whatnot. So, so it's taking over institutions that matters. Uh, and I don't see in this crisis any evidence that uh, alternative ways of looking at the economy have actually taken over, um, you know, key positions in academia, in policymaking institutions. So uh, there has been, you know, inroads and some acceptance from people in the mainstream. You know, they may at a point or another say, no, this is a Minsky moment. So, OK, fair enough. Somebody read a little bit of Minsky but I don't think enough to change uh, the profession. I, I, you know, that doesn't mean that there are you know, n not things that we can do. So, so th there are many things that heterodox economists ca can do to push the debate and change the profession a little bit. But the problem we have is, you know, think of, for example, the role of unions. Unions have lost a role. Economists on the left have had some space with unions. So there are economists at EPI, at uh, you know, think tanks in Washington, D.C. But the problem is that their influence to some extent, goes hand in hand with the left uh, within the Democratic Party, and and sure there was Bernie and all of these things, and uh, but it's not clear where the party is going uh, or that they will take over the party, which you know they'll have lots of resistance from people, you know, uh, that more or less shared you know uh, neoliberal conceptions with you know 
fellow Republicans within the Democratic Party. So, so it's, it's not clear to me, and it wasn't clear that this crisis would lead to significant change in the profession. I think it leads to more of the same. It leads to lots of mainstream economists that will be forced to depart from the core of the theory, which is the you know, general equilibrium, sort of markets are efficient thing, using some alternative things. So they can put something in their model and say, you know, in the general you know, equilibrium, you know, the computer, you know, whatever it is, the stochastic, uh, you know, General equilibrium models, uh, something that it means, a little bit of that stuff like that, and they you know come back and say, oh, the markets work, but you know there are all of these complications in the world, and and so we need to account for those in order to make it more accurate or whatever it is they they would say. Keynes has this famous phrase that you know that you know we're all slaves of that economist and that ideas, not vested interests govern you know the world. And on the other hand, I think you know, he, he missed the point. You know, classical economics is the fulcrum of neoliberal uh, you know, political views, vested interests uh, you know, have a very strong influence of what happens. But at the end of the day, vested interests have to be defended from some sort, of, there has to be you know, some sort of logical underlying idea of what's behind this sort of, uh, you know, this naked interests that are being you know, austerity in order to promote concentration of income at the top. And you know, so your austerity is for the poor, really. I mean, it's not austerity for everybody. Uh, you know, there was no austerity for bankers or you know, for rescuing you know, uh, big corporations. So, so, so one can sort of think of austerity as one of the important ideas within neoliberal uh, you know, uh, policy frameworks. Another thing that it's important, you know, it's austerity for whom. I mean, in economics, that's an important question. For whom is always, you know, the question that we should be asking. So who, who's benefiting, who's, who's losing? If you have to find a theoretical foundation for neoliberal policies, the only theoretical foundation really is neoclassical economic marginalism. That's at the core of this idea. So part of the role of the heterodoxy of alternative views is showing when we can, crises are very good, you know, how the emperor is naked, how, you know, some of these ideas are absolutely bogus, you know, and can be debunked.